Okay. How can I confidently deploy to production? This is a question I asked myself when I started as a junior developer three years ago. And I asked myself this question because I was really scared of breaking the application I was working on. And I felt I missed the certainty needed to confidently deploy new versions. And today I will tell you and how I gained the confidence I needed to deploy new versions of my service to production. In 2015, I was hired as a consultant to work on an old monolithic application. And every time I made code changes, I could run a whole suite of integration tests, which gave me some assurance that I had not completely broken the application. But then in 2016, my team was assigned to rebuild this monolithic application into smaller and more manageable services. And with this assignment, all the existing integration tests were, were impossible to port. So, and I was left without any certainty that the changes I made to the application would not have dire consequences to the system. So I had to figure out how can I confidently deploy to production? So this is an example illustration of a microservice architecture. We have a handful of services, but a microservice system can uh, be composed of more than a thousand services like it is at Netflix. So how would I ever be uh, confident that I won't break any dependencies if we have a thousand interconnected services? So the real question here is, how do we avoid the dependencies? And the answer to that is fairly simple. It's API versioning. API versioning is a great tool to decouple dependent microservices that I hope that you all use in your applications. And supporting multiple versions of an API makes further development possible because you remove all limitations that you will have from current users of the API. Unfortunately, we will have to run the risk of developing and maintaining a limitless amount of API versions unless we know when to make new versions and when we can remove old. So the next illustration show the relationship between an API provider and a consumer. And when a provider creates an API, they are really creating a contract to any consumer that wants to use their API. And this contract states, this is how you as a consumer can and should use my API. And when the provider wants to apply some changes to their service, it is their responsibility to make sure that they do not break any of the existing consumers. So to decouple the provider and the consumer, we need to use API versioning. But how do we know that we have a breaking change? Well, one so a possible solution is that you can find all your consumers, you can download all the code bases, and you can run the integration tests and make sure that it still works. But do you really know who your consumers are? And would you ever actually do this, download perhaps a 20 different code bases and running all the integration tests? No. So we need to find a better way of discovering these breaches. And a possible solution to that is consumer-driven contracts. Consumer-driven contracts is a testing paradigm where providers of an API encourages consumers to write integration tests for them. And in return, the consumer can be certain that the provider will not make any unwanted changes to the parts of the API that the consumer is using. So consumer-driven contract tests are exactly like normal uh, integration tests, but instead of being runnable from the consumer side, they're runnable from the provider side of the equation. So we take a look at this illustration again, and it has so far described the relationship between a provider and a consumer as a unidirectional relationship from the provider to the consumer. But to have a healthy relationship, we need to, have, uh, to expand it to include consumer contracts as well. And when the consumer writes consumer contracts, they're essentially telling the provider, this is how I am using your API. And the provider will now have access to uh, information about which consumers are using their application, which endpoints they're using, and how they're using the, uh, this data. And this is essential information to, uh, needed to be able to reduce the uh, number of API versions and to ensure stable services to the consumer. And with consumer-driven contracts, all of these questions will be answered. But how can we do this in practice? Well, we can uh, do this by using a framework called PACT. And that is a framework for implementing consumer-driven contracts. And PACT makes it very easy for consumers to write consumer contracts, or PACTs, as they're called for short. 
and it does so because it has multi-language support for creating pacts. This means that you can write pacts using the same programming language as you already use in your application. And PACT currently support languages like .NET, Java, Scala, Kotlin, Ruby, Swift, JavaScript, and more, so it's really versatile. PACT is also language independent during the verification process. This means that if you write your uh, consumer application using .NET, it doesn't matter that the provider is written in Java, because they can run the test anyway. And it's really easy for you to share your PACT uh, with the provider because the creators of Pact has created something called a Pact Broker, which is a, an, uh, an application that consumers will upload their Pacts to and where providers can download them when they need to verify Pacts. So now I'm going to show you a really short demo. We're going to take a look at the provider and see how I can verify Pacts during development. So the first thing that we are going to look at is the pack broker. So I can see that I have one consumer called the order application, and I have one provider called the customer. And if, if we take a look at this pact, we can see that I have a pact called create customer request. And this is basically just a, uh, an ex uh, a request that we want to send to the application and a uh, response that we are expecting. So we are expected to send a post to the customer endpoint with a body, and I expect that application to respond with a HTTP status of 201, and I expect it to get a matching body like this. So to take a look at all the code that we need to do to verify this pact. So I'm just stating that I am the provider customer, which is the provider uh, application in this example, and I want to get all my pacts from the pact broker located at localhost and port 3000. And then I want to say, I want to start my application because I am not working with dummy data. I'm actually starting my provider application, and then I'm performing these requests to this application instance. And then I'm doing some matching on the response. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to run the pact verification test to make sure that we are in compliance with the pact. The test passes because we are. So we just verified a pact between order and customer, the create uh, customer request, uh, it had a state of 200 and, uh, status code of 201 and a matching body. So we had all the data we needed. But now I'm going to do some further development on this application. I personally, I hate abbreviations, so I don't want this to be called SSN. This absolutely has to be called social security number. But just to make sure, I, I now want to rerun my pact verification test to see that I'm still in compliance with this pact. But as you probably figured, of course I'm not because I just changed the name of one of the input and output fields to my application. So I can see here that the, custom, no, the order application, the consumer, is expecting a field called SSN, but it's not present. Instead, there's a field called social security number. So my, uh, I, want, I want this field to be called social security number in my code, but I can, so I can fix this by just saying, I want during serialization and deserialization, to remap this field to a field called SSN. So now I can perform a new pact verification to again make sure that I'm in compliance. And I am. So during development, I could actually see that my change would break one of my consumers and I could fix it even before deploying to a test environment. So that was a short demo I was going to do. I'm just going to jump back into the uh, presentation. So one final thought about this topic. Consumer-driven contracts keep development projects agile by letting developers discover bugs both during development and before deploying even to the test environment. And performing contract verification before deploying will give developers the confidence they need to deploy their applications and know that they have not breached any API contracts or any consumers. So I have a larger code demo available. You can find that on my GitHub. Uh, and it's github.com slash steamo with a zero. And if you have any questions, you can reach me on Twitter, you can reach me by email, and I will be by the stage if you have any questions right now. So thank you so much for your attention.